What's up everybody, how's it going? As most of you have probably heard by now, the artificial intelligence research company called OpenAI recently launched ChatGPT, an absolutely incredible large language model artificial intelligence chatbot that you can talk to and that can explain things to you, do things for you in absolutely mind-bending, magical, terrifying, astounding ways. And in this video, I wanna walk you through 10 different applications, live interactions with ChatGPT to show you just how incredible it is. Now, one thing I wanna point out before I jump into the first interaction is that ChatGPT does not have access to the internet. In other words, it can't just Google things, which makes it all the more impressive when you ask it to explain things to you that seem like they could have just been Google searched because they were not. And to prove this to you, if you ask ChatGPT something like, what is the Bitcoin price right now? You will see that it will tell you, I do not have access to the internet. I'm a large language model that was trained on data up to 2021, something like that. See, I'm sorry, but I'm not able to browse the internet. So. Keeping that in mind, let's jump into the first interaction. Let's imagine that I'm a college student, a high school student, and I need to write a five paragraph essay about the famous book called Pride and Prejudice. I really don't wanna do that. I don't know where to start. I'm gonna to go to ChatGPT and I'm gonna say, write a five paragraph essay on one of the underlying themes of Pride and Prejudice. Boom, and let's see what it comes out with. Now, one thing to keep in mind, it is a little bit slow right now because there are tons of people using ChatGPT at the same time. Yesterday when I was playing around with it, it was much quicker in its responses. But so now we see it starting to write. One of the underlying themes of Jane Austen's novel, Pride and Prejudice, is the societal pressure for women to marry for financial stability and social status rather than for love. And it goes on and it explains it in very good, coherent writing with seemingly accurate data and information. You know, this theme is exemplified in the character of Mrs. Bennet, Elizabeth's mother, who is obsessed with marrying off her daughters. And then it goes on with actually well-structured paragraphs. This is absolutely insane. Now, I realize that this poses a bit of an ethical concern and operational concern with cheating and all sorts of things. I don't have answers for that. I'm merely just showing you what this tool does. Now let's go on with a second interaction. Let's imagine that we're a skydiving company and we want to have a liability waiver for people to sign, you know, to say that they don't hold the skydiving company liable if there's an accident during the, the activity. So write a liability waiver for a skydiving, skydiving company. Let's see if it can give us a document that would otherwise cost us some amount of money either online or with a lawyer. It would cost a lot with a lawyer. So, dear skydiving company customers, by participating in a skydiving activity organized by a skydiving company, you acknowledge and agree to the following. And it starts to list out all these things that you would expect in an actual liability waiver. Skydiving is potentially hazardous activity, blah, blah, blah. You understand that weather conditions can be unpredictable. You assume all risks and dangers associated with participating in the activities. This is insane. In just a couple of seconds here, I got for free, at least right now, this is fairly accessible, a seemingly perfect liability waiver, or at least, you know, an acceptable one that would have otherwise cost me a lot of money. And this is actually useful for my business operations. So now let's move on to a third interaction. Let's assume that uh, I am dealing with cyber squatters, people who bought a domain for a company or a website that I own, and they are illegally you know, squatting that domain. They're using it. And I want them to stop doing that. So I'm going to send them a cease and desist letter, something that would cost, again, a lot of money with, through a lawyer or, you know, finding one online, or at least it would take a lot of time to write one. So write a cease and desist letter for cyber squatters. Let's see what ChatGPT can do for us here. To whom it may concern, this letter is a formal cease and desist notice regarding the unauthorized use of and here you put in your trademark on your website and you put in the URL. We have determined that your use of the trademark on a website constitutes cyber squatting. Then they explain what the cyber squatting is. 
They, you know, point to some like legal things like the Anti-Cyber Squatting Consumer Protection Act. We demand that you immediately stop using blah, blah, blah. If you do not immediately comply with this notice, we will be forced to take further legal action. This could include seeking an injunction, seeking damages for profits. This is absolutely amazing. Like this is a very good, acceptable, simple cease and desist letter. At the very least, it's a good, you know, baseline to then create, you know, create your own cease and desist letter, add things to it. Absolutely incredible. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and let's go down more of a scientific or, you know, a mathy path for the chat GPT. Let's ask chat GTP to write an easy binary tree problem for algo experts. Let's see if it knows about Algo Expert. By the way, if you're a software engineer preparing for a technical interview, do check out my company, Algo Expert. Go to algoexpert.io and use the promo code CLEM, C L E M, for a discount on the platform. You are given the root node of a binary tree and a target value. Write a function that determines whether the tree contains a node with a given target value. The function should return a Boolean value true. It even puts the back ticks and like codifies it if the value is found and false if it is not. To solve this problem, oh, and it gives us the solution. You can use a depth for the search algorithm to traverse the tree. Wait, so what is it asking? determines whether the tree contains a node with a given value. Okay, so this is a super easy problem. And look, look, it, it writes the problem. It gives us the code and it even puts like the sample tree here commented like we do on Algo Expert. I wonder if that's like just the de facto way that it writes coding interview problems or if it just like knows that on Algo Expert we write it like this. Like this is how we write trees in Algo Expert in the prompts, how we like portray them to customers. And look, it gives us it gives us the code. This is incredible. Like I'm just mind blown. This is absolutely mind blowing. I wonder like what would happen if I asked it to write a hard problem. Let's let's try that. And by the way, here it cut off. I heard that the reason it cuts off uh, sometimes is because there's a limit to how many characters it can spit out and you have to just tell it to keep going. Like I think if I tell it to keep going here it's going to keep going. But what if I say, "Okay, now write a hard binary tree problem." for algo expert. Let's see if it can come up with a hard binary tree problem. You are given the root node of a binary tree and a target value. Write a function that returns the minimum number of steps required to reach the target value in the tree. Okay, that is actually pretty hard because you can imagine that the tree could have multiple of, first you have to find the target value. Then you can imagine that the tree might have multiple of the target value. It's not super difficult. So here, that's the, the first time where I'm a tiny bit disappointed. Keep in mind, it's very like luxurious of me to say that I'm disappointed. Tiny bit disappointed because this is not that part of a problem. But still, the fact that it's like coming up with this problem in the first place, and then it's giving me like example of the code and all that. I don't know. That's absolutely incredible. It looks like it's writing in JavaScript. Okay, so it can clearly do coding stuff. Now uh, let's move on to math. Let's say write a proof for Firma's little theorem. Now, keep in mind, it cannot Google. It is not Googling this. It has just been trained with data up until 2021. I think 2021 was the cutoff. Uh, so it's not Googling this. Firma's little theorem states that if P is a prime number, then for any integer A, the number A raised to the pth power is congruent to A modulo P. In other words, if P is prime and A is an integer, then A to the power of P equals a, or congruent rather, to a mod p. So here I'd put an equal instead of congruent. Usually you have three lines for congruent. But to prove this theorem, we first know that if a is divisible by p, then the theorem is obviously true. Obvious to whom? Um, but it's funny, like, I didn't even ask for a step-by-step -step proof, and it's giving me a step-by-step -step proof. This shows that the left-hand side and right-hand side of the equation are congruent modulo p, which means that the theorem is true. I'm not gonna actually try to figure out if the proof was actually correct. I'm actually gonna assume that it was, hopefully I'm not wrong, but um, this is still like, I don't know, this is this is mind blowing. It's, it's and it, you know what's even more mind blowing or more like terrifying? The fact that now after having played with this a little bit and after having seen so many people talk about it online for the last week or two, I almost feel like this is normal. Like I'm less impressed by it. You know, I start to be more picky with it, which is terrifying. Because you, you realize like the slippery slope that we're kind of falling into. Anyway, here's a fun one that I want to ask ChatGPT. Write a mathematical proof about a math property that is actually incorrect. Do your best to deceive me. Let's see if it can do that. You've probably seen some of those like puzzles where, you know, people prove that like one is equal to zero or something like that. And there's one little mistake in the proof. 
Let's see if it can do that. Here's a proof that shows that the square root of two is equal to one, which is obviously not true. We know that the square root of a number is the value that, when multiplied by itself, equals the original number, yes. So to find the square root of two, we need to find the value that, when multiplied by itself, equals two, yes. Let's assume that the square root of two is equal to one. If we multiply one by one, we get one times one equals one, but we want the result to be two, so we need to modify our assumption. Let's try adding one to both sides of the equation. If the square root of two is equal to one, then the square root of two plus one is equal to one plus one, which is two. So the square root of three is equal to two. Now let's square both sides of the equation and we get a proof by, con okay, this is getting too complicated for me in this video, in this short video, but I will leave it as an exercise to the viewers to actually read this and see if you kind of grok it and get deceived by it. But the fact that it's like going through these steps, like as if it were a human being, you know, it's mind blowing to me. Okay, let's go back to something that could be really practically useful. I forgot that I have an early morning work meeting tomorrow, and I've already made plans that won't allow me to attend the meeting. Write an email to my manager that provides a very believable and acceptable excuse for why I won't be able to attend the meeting. Let's say that, you know, it's like midnight, you forgot that you have a 7 a.m. meeting, you won't be able to attend, and you need to get out of it. Let's see if Jad VPD can help us. Dear manager, I apologize for any inconvenience this may cause, but I have a family emergency come up unexpectedly, and I won't be able to attend the meeting tomorrow morning. I will make sure to follow up with the team and provide any updates as needed. Again, I apologize for any inconvenience, and I appreciate your understanding. Okay, simple, not too detailed. Okay, I'll accept it. What if we said, what if we said, do another one, but without any sort of family emergency. Let's see what it can come up with this time. Dear manager, I apologize for any inconvenience. Okay, same thing. I have a doctor's appointment that I completely forgot about and it cannot be rescheduled. Okay, same thing. Not bad, still not bad. Now let's do a fun one. What would be the best 3v3 arena comp in Wrath of the Lich King? Wrath of the Lich King was the third or the second WoW expansion. And uh, here I'm curious if it's gonna say Rogue Mage Priest. That was one of the best 3v3 arena comps. Oh, I'm not familiar with the game you're referring to. Okay, okay, wait, let's see. Um, I am referring to World of Warcraft, specifically the Wrath of the Lich King expansion. What is the best 3v3 arena comp comp during that expansion. Let's see if it if it can figure that out. First time that we've kind of stumped it. I'm sorry, but I'm not familiar with the game you're referring to. Really? Let's try again. Let's just say, what is the best 3v3 arena comp in World of Warcraft? Let's see if without providing the expansion, it can give us some sort of information. Although this question doesn't really make sense, to be honest, because Every expansion is different and everything. Okay, so it looks like it cannot answer this question. This is the first question that, like, we've completely stumped it. Okay, well, there's an improvement to make to the OpenAI team. Okay, I've got two more interactions that I wanna go through. The first one is gonna be, give me a detailed comparison of Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Let's see if it can give us something Good here, accurate, substantial, let's see. Bitcoin and Ethereum are two of the most widely known and used cryptocurrencies. While both are based on blockchain technology, they both have some significant differences. Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency to be created. Okay, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer currency, proof of work consensus mechanism, yes. Ethereum, on the other hand, was designed to be a decentralized platform that enables the creation of smart contracts and dApps, very true. In contrast to Bitcoin, which is primarily a digital currency, Ethereum is more like a programmable blockchain that allows developers to build applications on top of it. It uses proof of stake consensus, consensus mechanism, true, at least as of recently. Oops, looks like there was a network error, but up until where I was reading, that was a pretty good answer. Let's go through the last interaction in the style of Donald Trump. Explain the A star, whoops, explain the A star search algorithm to me. Let's see how this 
turns out. The A-star search algorithm is the best way to find a path from one place to another. It's a great algorithm, believe me. No one knows more about search algorithms than me. <laughs> A-star is a smart algorithm. It knows how to find the shortest path. It's a very, very fast algorithm too. It can search through a lot of actions in no time. It's the best algorithm, I can guarantee it. Okay, you can you can see the the like Donald Trumpism in that. That was a pretty short explanation. All right, I'm gonna stop here because I feel like I could go on forever. I would encourage all of you watching to go play with ChatGPT yourselves. I'll put the link in the description below. Let me know what you thought about these interactions. Do you find them as mind blowing and magical and terrifying and astounding as I do? Because I'm telling you, I really do find them all of the above. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter if you enjoy short form written content, Instagram if you like pictures, and I will see you in the next video.